Okay, let's look at the second one of these. So this is the second article that you would have picked up in class or the second one that is listed here in Blackboard, depending on how you get it. So what I would like to do to start off with is uh, I want you to pause the video again. Uh, this time I'd like you to pause it for six minutes and I'd like you to take six minutes to sort of scan through this particular article and see how you do with it. So hit pause now. Okay, welcome back. A um, couple of things before we get into this particular article. One of the things that I didn't mention about the previous article that you reviewed uh, was its publication source. If you look at that particular article, it actually came from a journal known as the Review of Educational Research. Now, the Review of Educational Research, or, or RER, is essentially a journal that publishes really three types of articles. Um, it publishes literature reviews, it publishes meta-analysis and meta-synthesis, or I guess you could really say two types of articles. So literature reviews and then articles that do meta-studies. Now meta-studies are studies where the data is actually other published research. So really a meta-study is kind of like a systematic literature review that is using a particular type of methodological function or methodological feature. So the Review of Educational Research is published by the American Education Research Association and um, which is one of the main, actually the main uh, organization in North America for educational researchers and it is a very high quality journal. I mentioned that, and I apologize I didn't mention it at the uh, end of the last video, but as I'm looking at this particular article, you can see that uh, up here in the top right-hand corner, it was published by Educational Administration Quarterly, uh, which is a publication of the University Council for Educational Administration. Now, UCEA is the main organization for faculty members in educational leadership and educational administration. So this organization is essentially for professors in programs like the one we have here at Sacred Heart and, and other universities that are preparing administrators and educational leaders. The Journal Educational Admin Quarterly or Educational Administration Quarterly or EAQ is one of three or four journals that uh, UCEA sponsors and it's sort of their oldest, it's, it's their flagship journal if you will, like another one for example is their journal of uh, educational leadership cases where they actually it's like a case study kind of journal where they take um, the same kind of case studies that you might have for uh, your Connecticut administrators test you know those kinds of, uh, of um, activities and, and you know so they'll present a case and then they'll have certain discussion questions or commentary about it um, now in the case of EAQ this is their main research journal so most of what you find in here will be systematic research empirical research or uh, literature review articles so just to give you sort of a sense because one of the things you can use as a sort of a measure of the quality of some of the articles that you're reading is as you start to become familiar with some of the journals and as we move later on in the course we'll actually look at um, some of the ways in which you can determine the quality of a journal um, although for your purposes meaning for the purposes of writing a six-year or postmaster's thesis, um, those things aren't as important. Um, they're more things that are useful to know or nice to know, not things that are critical to know or must know in order to be able to accomplish the task you've got ahead of you over the next 12 months. So looking at this particular article, For Grades or Money, Charter School Failure in North Carolina. Um, now, the reason I chose this article, actually the reason I chose both of the articles for this week, um, were twofold. First, to be able to go through and point out some of the um, nice things about the article, but also some of the shortcomings. So if you remember, the previous article uh, had a really well-written abstract, but the conclusions were, uh, that section was a little bit limiting in terms of what it was covering. If you look at this one, you probably are now starting to use some of the features that I talked about in the previous video in terms of how to go about reading this. Um, so 
in the last video I would have told you to start with the abstract and to spend a bit of time with the abstract. Now you'll notice that the abstract for this particular article is written a little differently than the abstract for the previous article. While it still has the same features, you'll notice here that there are a couple of words that are bolded and uh, almost like headings in there. And when you see this in an abstract, it's usually an indication that these are requirements of the journal. So essentially, this journal, Educational Admin Quarterly, or EAQ, requires all of its authors to construct their abstract with these three things in mind, and only these three things in mind. Now, what this means for an author is that it constrains them. You know, they can't focus in upon the things that they would normally want to focus in upon because they don't have complete freedom. Not saying that the authors of this article wouldn't have talked a little bit about the purpose, wouldn't have talked a little bit about the research design, wouldn't have talked a little bit about the findings, um, because if you look at the previous article we reviewed, all those three things were in there. Um, the difference between this one and the previous article is, if you remember, there were a statement or two in there that sort of gave you the, the overall you know, the summary or the conclusions kind of thing. Um, whereas this article really doesn't have that because there's nothing there that says, you know, conclusions or summary or conclusions and implications or anything like that. Um, but having said that, you know, it, it's not that this is a bad abstract or it's not that this is a less useful abstract. It's just important to note that when you see this kind of thing as you look at an abstract, the thing that you need to remember is that, or that you need to be cognizant of, is the fact that this particular publication, or the publication you happen to be reading at the time, is constraining its authors to some extent in terms of what they can include or what they need to include in their abstract. So, looking at the abstract of this one, you know, you've got three sentences at the beginning that essentially give you the purpose. Now, in most cases, a purpose statement can generally be written in a single sentence, and the authors here likely could have rewritten this into a single sentence, because if you look at it, really the first two sentences in the purpose area aren't the purpose of the research at all. It's that third sentence in this article, we examine charter school accountability. That's the purpose of this article. The first two really are kind of like what you saw in the previous article, where they're setting the stage or providing you with some context. You know, so in this particular case, you know, they say public schools are unique, or sorry, charter schools are unique public schools in part because this type of school can close if it fails to meet the objectives set forth by the chartering body that approve it or that approved it. The implication there, or what's on written, is that most public schools don't have the ability to do that. Thus far, however, little research has been conducted into the causes of charter school closures. So while charter schools are a type of public school that can close, there hasn't been, at least as of you know when the authors conducted this study, and it was published in 2014, and we'll talk a little bit about publication dates and when that means the article um, or the study was likely conducted uh, in a later class. Um, but, you know, at that stage, there hadn't been that much research in this. So looking specifically at their research design, they tell you that, well, there are four types of accountability when you look at um, the limited research that is available around charter schooling. And they're using that to essentially do a historical analysis of why charter schools in North Carolina have failed, um, trying to, I assume, put them into one, of, one or more of those four types of accountability. In addition to that, they're going to present two specific cases of us that sort of better illustrate how each of these four types of accountability come into play. In terms of what they found based upon that study, um, three of the four types, because you can see now they're starting to type about, talk about accountability. So market accountability, bureaucratic accountability, and financial accountability uh, are three of those four types. And it seems that those three tend to be the ones that um, are likely to cause a school to close. 
based upon their particular analysis, it seems that financial accountability of those three tend to be the one that is the most common. You know, so again, even though the authors are constrained by having to write to these specific topics from the purpose, we've got a fairly good idea just from the abstract of what this particular article is about. You know, they're looking at charter schools in North Carolina and why they fail. They generally fail, at least according to the literature, because of one of four types of accountability. Based upon the individual study in North Carolina that these guys did, they found that market, bureaucratic, and financial accountabilities were the most common ones, but financial was the one that played the largest role. Pretty good summary or synopsis of, of what we've got here, without even having to get past the first you know hundred words or so in this article. So again, using the model that we developed or that we talked about last time, we're going to skip down now to the conclusion to see what's going on in that conclusion area. So going down to page sorry I passed it there. 530. Now if you notice this article compared to the last one has a much more detailed conclusion. You know we've got a full page and a half a full four paragraphs as to what was you know found and, and those three functions that we're looking for in a particular article. Um, so if you start and I'm not going to read this one like I did the last one because of the length but as you're looking through what you've got essentially is this first paragraph here starts to look at sort of the issue overall. So they start giving you some background about it and they start to touch on the overall findings. When you get into the second paragraph, they start to narrow in on the findings that they had for those two specific cases that they said they were going to tell us about. Moving into this third paragraph here, you're starting to get into, uh, again, they're, they're trying to tie in these two cases with the overall findings, but you'll notice they're starting also to move into the implications of practice. Um, you know, so specifically as you start to get into this last sentence here, you know, so these first four sentences or so of this third paragraph are still summarizing the article and summarizing the study but when we get into this last sentence now they're starting to talk about you know or at least allude to the implications for practice so they're basically saying you know knowing how and why charter schools fail um, failures are due to mechanisms of accountability should allow policymakers to give better direction to current and future leaders of charter schools. So essentially by understanding that there are these four things and in particular that you know there's this one thing that seems to be really important those folks that are making policy around charter schools at least in North Carolina should be able to give charter school leaders a, a better direction. Um, and they continue to look at that that implication for practice if you will in that fourth paragraph. So now they're basically starting, you know, to talk about not just the leaders of the schools, but they're also looking at policymakers. And in this fourth paragraph here now, they're basically talking about, um, you know, making recommendations or suggestions or giving advice to both charter school leaders as well as policymakers who are making policy around charter schools as to things they should keep in mind based upon you know what we found in this particular or what the authors have found in this particular study and then if you look at this final paragraph this fifth paragraph here um, this is where they're moving now more to the you know avenues for future research or suggestions for future research you know so they talk a little bit in this first sentence here about how you know while this is a good study it's a important study and it's sort of one of the first times we've done this study it only looks at North Carolina 
you know, and North Carolina is specific to North Carolina, you know, so charter school law and the nature of charter schools and the demands placed upon them and the pressures placed upon them in North Carolina are going to be different than what they would be in Ohio or in California or here in Connecticut, um, you know, so because of that, future research should start to look at some of these areas. So, you know, they say consider looking at it in other states uh, states because you know differences in state law might be a uh, useful in predicting uh, the nature of accountability and the problems that might exist with different types of accountability um, the other thing that you could look at is you could look at this issue on a national level to see if you know this idea of these four types of accountabilities and financial being the most important continue to be the trend that we see on a national level or is North Carolina sort of unique in that perspective. Um, they also suggest that since at least based upon this study that financial accountability is so important we also want to examine that in greater detail. Um, you know to see exactly you know what both internally and externally is influencing um, you know the financial success of charter schools. And then they end with, you know, basically a statement that regardless of which of these areas that you choose to research, it's important that we continue to examine uh, charter school accountability and charter school closures. So, you know, regardless of which of these suggestions you take, they're basically saying that they want folks to continue to move along this particular avenue of research or this particular line of research when it comes to charter schooling. You know, so again, you're getting a really good sense as to what they found. And given the fact that they spend so much time up here, I mean, really, it's, you know, three and a half, um, sorry, two and a half full paragraphs up here summarizing the study. So really, I mean, basically, you know, all of this area here is their summary of the study in the article. That gives you a really good sense as to what was found. And like the last one, if I read things in here that look interesting to me, I'm going to go back to the results section and I'm going to start to scan through the results looking for instances of that. Um, you know, so for example, here in the middle of the second paragraph, they talk a little bit about financial mismanagement. You know, so if that's something that I'm particularly interested in, and actually they continue it into the next sentence as well, you'll notice. Um, you know, so basically it forms, when you're looking at those two cases, it forms essentially half of the conversation that they have about those two cases, at least in terms of what they want you to take away from those two cases. So if that was something that was of interest to me, I might go out back up to the results and start scanning for, you know, financial mismanagement or just those terms, you know, mis particularly mismanagement. Um, you know, so that's how I would go about this one. Again, you know, it's one of those things that it, it allows you to quickly determine whether or not the article is going to be or may be or will likely be useful to you. And then if it appears that it won't be, you can discard it now, or at least move on, I should say, not necessarily discard it. In terms of speeding up your time, if it is useful to you, you know, scanning through the results uh, will obviously cut down some time on this, but if, uh, you know, at the end of the day, as you start to develop your, you know, cadre of 25, 30, 35 articles or pieces of literature that you plan to use in your um, actual literature review that you're writing for your thesis, you know, those are ones that you're probably going to spend, you know, a half hour, hour looking through and dissecting and, and trying to find the commonalities between them and, and those kinds of things. Um, so, like the last article, one of the things that I did want to do is to go through and look at this one as an example of a literature review. So I'm going to go back to where the literature review starts for this particular article. And that basically is back here on the... Oh, that's the context. Just want to make sure I got it in the right spot back here on the top of 
page 504. Uh, so the section that begins failure of charter schools is really where the literature review starts. Now you'll note they do have some literature cited here in this background or context, but for the most part as you look through you can see that it's really um, one particular article, so this uh, the Fulco and Ladd 2007 article, and then the other citations are all pieces of legislation or pieces of policy. So you can see here uh, they cite a piece of legislation. You know, here's a particular policy that they're talking about. Um, when they use this North Carolina 1995, that's again uh, a piece of policy or a policy document that's been done. You can see North Carolina 95 here. So that's basically just giving you background to the context. And in many articles, you'll actually find that somewhere in the methodology section. But the literature review begins here on the top of page 504. So if you look at this, what you see in this one, as opposed to the article that we looked at with student evaluation of teaching, where they essentially had that narrowing or funneling function that we were talking about, this one, while it has a little bit of this, it's really more of a topical or thematic literature review that you have here. So, as you can see, we start off with a section here on the failure of charter schools. So they basically start to tell you this is what we know from the literature about why or how charter schools fail. And then you've got basically a page, um, two pages, two pages and a bit that look at this issue of, of why charter schools fail. Now, this is kind of where the little bit of narrowing happens because one of the reasons why charter schools fail is due to accountability. And so, you know, you've got a little bit of narrowing between, you know, these are all the reasons charter schools fail. Now, let's look at the aspects of accountability that contribute to charter school failure. So there's a little bit of narrowing or a little bit of funneling there, but then it moves into a topical discussion. So what you find, and you get this again from that abstract, there are four types of accountability that contribute to charter school failure. And so the authors, as you can see, will essentially spend a subsection so here's your sort of main section, and then you'll see there are four of these subsections here that look at the different types of accountability. So as we see here, there's a performance accountability, market accountability, bureaucratic accountability, and financial accountability. Those are the four that um, occur. And if you're looking at the coverage, if you will, of each of these, you can see we have about a half a page, a little bit better than half a page, um, but, you know, two paragraphs that introduce accountability in general. So you get a sort of a sense of, you know, the field as a whole. And you see there's about a dozen different citations that they've got there. Some are repeated, so when you get rid of the repeating ones, I think there's like eight to ten that are listed there. Now, when you look at the different types of accountability, you know, we've got a single paragraph and two citations for performance accountability. We've got three paragraphs and I think it's six or seven citations about market accountability. Then we're back to a single paragraph about bureaucratic accountability. Granted, you'll note that there are four citations in this one. And then there's financial accountability, which is back to a paragraph again, and then there's also two citations. So one of the things that you can note right off the bat, just by looking at the coverage that's given to this, is when I'm looking at the different types of accountability for charter schools, most of the literature appears to be focused upon market accountability. After that, it seems that there is you know, about in terms of numerically speaking, if these guys have done a comprehensive job, about half as many um, articles that have been written about bureaucratic accountability, whereas performance accountability and financial accountability seem to be the two areas where there's the least known about. I mention that because you'll note that in this particular study, the authors found that financial accountability, at least in the context of these North Carolina virtual sc or charter school closures, was the most important type of accountability. 
But yet, when you look at the literature, it seems to be one of the areas where there's the least amount of literature that focuses specifically upon financial accountability, which is probably why when you go back to that last paragraph of the entire article where they're making suggestions for future research, they spend so much time focusing upon the issue of you know, looking at the financial accountability in this sector and looking at accountability in general because, you know, if you think about it, charter schools have been with us since the early 90s. But when you're looking at, you know, and obviously there's a lot of reasons why they close. There's two and a half pages of literature that they talk about, about, you know, why charter schools fail or why charter schools close. But there's only this much here about accountability in general. And, you know, so it starts to give you a sense as to, you know, where the literature is. And this is a good example of how you're starting to develop ideas for your own thesis. You know, because one of the things you will find as you are doing your literature review is you will discover that, you know, there's a lot known in the field that I'm interested in or on the, around the topic that I'm interested in about, you know, X, Y, and Z, but there's very little that's known about, um, you know, A, B, and C. And as you can see here, the authors have used their literature review in much the same way that you're going to use your literature review to illustrate how there are some gaps in the literature. You know, so not only, you know, are, is this, you know, are these articles designed to sort of, you know, teach you how to read through them. And um, as we move through the course, we'll start to look at the idea of good research and bad research and how you start to pick apart research to determine, you know, if it's good or bad, but also as a way of, you know, using them as a way to, to see how they use the different components of the research process to determine, you know, what should be studied for their purposes, and then also how they can use what they find from their own study as a way of making recommendations for future research when you consider what we already know about the topic as presented here in the literature review. And that's essentially, you know, the process that you're going to go through. You will conduct a literature review. You identify areas of weakness or gaps or holes in the literature, essentially areas where we don't know as much as we should, or in particular where you're interested in knowing more about, but that's also supported by a lack of literature. Based upon that, you're going to design a study you'll find the results of that study and you'll discuss the results of that study in light of what was already known. So you'll essentially talk about how what you found is consistent or inconsistent or adds to what we already knew from the existing literature. And then one of the things that you're going to do in your chapter 5 as you tie all this together is you're going to make suggestions for future researchers. So, you know, again, I think like I said in class, if you had to give advice to students who were interested in your topic next year, after you've already gone through this process, what would you suggest that they study based upon what you know about the topic and what you learned in your study?